controversies make great TV, right? The ratings follow. And, and I imagine you are encouraged in that job to be you, who mm. is outspoken and unpredictable and you've got opinions on things. And there's a line and I guess the bosses want you to get right up to that line but not cross it. And sometimes you cross it and that comes with the package, right? Mm. That's why mm. your numbers were so incredible because people would tune in. Some would tune in to love you, some would tune in to hate you, some would tune in just to see what you've got to yeah. say. And a lot of the people that hate you, they tune in to have their prejudices about you reinforced. Mm. You know, well, that's fine. So we're thinking about, I mean, there, there are a, a list of, of controversies. When you think back at them, do you reflect on them? Do you think they were mistakes? Were they, was that part and parcel of the job? How, how, do you, how do you dwell on that Well, it now? was definitely part and parcel of the, the job um, in that I was employed just to be me and it was the way I was. And, you know, were they mistakes? I mean, there are a couple of things that I did that, that better judgment would say don't do, but I wasn't prejudging what I did. I was just doing it, you know. And that was the beauty. It's the beauty of me, really. I mean, I... I've given no thought to this interview at all. Um, and people would say to me, you know, I, I, you know, do you get nervous before you go on? You get nervous before you do something if you think too much about it because if you don't do it the way you've thought about it, you think it's, it's you know, fucking up. But if you don't think about it, if you just say, look, they've employed me to be me, so I'll go in and be me. And the day they stop employing me will be the day they don't want me anymore for whatever reason. But I never want to be employed because I'm not me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, you know, and, and, and people will talk about the, the, the famous things I allegedly did wrong or the controversies and that, and they will ignore the fact that I was doing three hours live television five days a week for seven years. If you have three hours worth of conversation with your partner five days a week for seven years, you're going to say some things that you possibly shouldn't have, yeah. you know? Yeah. and. And so you've got to sort of, the, the beauty of being with someone who isn't guarded, who's just seeing something for the first time, and that used to happen to me quite often, I'd, I'd, I'd see something, and I think people at home have seen that too, and I'd say, hang on a second, just can you play that back again? What's happening in the background there? And then you'd laugh about it. You've seen it, but none of it's pre-planned, yeah. you know? And, and that was the beauty of it. So sometimes there was someone doing something they're not supposed to do there, and you've highlighted it. And you started to laugh at it and then saw what they were doing. Oh, shit. Yeah. You know? But you're in, you're out, yeah. you know? Well, yeah, it, did, it did appear manic at times. Like you say, it's, it's, it's unnatural to be that intense and that tuned in and that sleep-deprived for so long. Yeah. Um, the dick shit one springs to mind. And it's like, uh, from what I understand, that was the way you pronounced it. That was name, her name. Dick yeah. shit. You were told to pronounce it differently. Yeah. You went with the, the real name. The official pronunciation it, was and Dixit. It, and it became an international. Became an inter well, but did it? Some absolute twat working for foreign affairs in India apologized. And I know this for a fact. When they apologized, no one knew what they were talking about. So this apology, which was not solicited, they didn't know anything about it, was offered without authorization from New Zealand by this foreign affairs person in India. And all of a sudden, it becomes an incident. The funny thing is, I received quite a few um, uh, emails, uh, one way or another, they got to me through TVNZ, from students of Sheila Dixit's, who said she actively laughed about her own name because she was a minister of the crown in India, but also was a lecturer at university. And she said, uh, and she, would, would, she credited her success in life to her surname that people laughed about. You know, but I mean, God, I could not do now the sort of jobs I've done in the past because New Zealand has become so prissy and so specific and political. I hate that term politically correct, but th there's an element of truth in it. Um, and I hate the term woke, but there's an element of truth in it. You know, I just couldn't, I just wouldn't bow down to that now because at the end of the day, we talked about it before, it comes down to communication. You know, I'm just a bloke and I'm just seeing it as, you know, telling it as I see it. Did, did it matter to you, you you've just said oh, what Dick Shit's response was. Did it matter to you how they took it in these controversies? Like the moustache on the, well, the woman? Well, that's, a good, that's a, good, a, a good example because I was led to believe, although I never heard this firsthand, that she was upset about it. And of course, I'd never intended to upset anyone, you know, and I don't intend to upset anyone. So, yes, I'm sorry that someone was upset by it. But am I sorry for actually doing it? I mean... You, you can't be sorry for doing it in hindsight. 
because you didn't have all that information up front because that's what hindsight is. You know, in exactly that situation again, would I have done it? Yes. Would I do it again in exactly that situation again? Yes, I would. And, and people say, oh, but, but look, she was so, but you don't know these things going in. And you can avoid saying anything that may vaguely upset anyone, but then what you're doing is avoiding saying anything at all, you know, and you're just becoming another script reader. Is it a frustration that those handful of incidents kind of characterize your time in the spotlight in New Zealand? When you consider, like you said, five days a week, three hours a, three hours a morning, yeah. over seven years, that's a shitload of TV. Shitload. But those situations seem to repeatedly pop up. People bring them up all the time. Um, but I suppose in a sense they are the highlights. Some people would say the lowlights, but they're the highlights of a career um, because they were hugely publicised. Like my sacking, I was the biggest racist in this country, right? That was the, the – my sacking was framed, you know, mm. biggest racist in the country. And I literally had to go and hide out. Like there were journalists – Staking out my mother's rest home, you know, in case I went there. Staking out my girlfriend's house, you know, literally camped in my driveway. Um, so, I mean, that's how big a racist I was that I required that kind of scrutiny. My private life required that kind of scrutiny. Um, but it's all, yeah, it's part of the rich tapestry. I, I, I think listening listening back to your earlier stories, that I, I, I and during the research I clocked a... I think you were going to like a conference in Sky City and there was like a demonstration at the front, quite heated. I think someone spat at you. Yeah, that wasn't even that long ago. Yeah. They were demonstrating at the National Party Conference, which was being held in there. And I was going there for uh, someone had auctioned lunch with me as a charity lunch. So I had given up my precious time because I'm so bloody wholesome to, to go and have lunch with strangers who were paying money to a charity. But I suppose someone... Well, because I was just evil. You know, I represented the evil, corporate, wealthy assholes running this country. But was that a regular kind of occurrence to have those everyday... That was an extreme. Right. But, yeah. But toned down those sorts of situations no, in do public? You know, not much. And the number of people would just come up to me and say the loveliest things, you know. I think a lot of people um, are frightened of saying the wrong, you know. You, people are more likely to say nothing at all but certainly more likely to say something nice and want a photograph or something like that than they are to come up and attack you on something. I remember I was leaving a restaurant once and, no, no, I was in a restaurant once and someone got up and walked out and said, I'm not going to sit in here with this racist. They didn't say it to me. They said it as they walked past. I said, excuse me, if you want to talk to me about anything, you're welcome to talk. Of course, then they ran, you know. I mean, I'm not a racist, but I'm not interested in saying that. Do you know, you, you know what I mean? I don't... I, but, there is nothing that's happened to me that makes me even remotely interested in trying to prove that I'm not. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I feel like you're the kind of guy that if the abuse and the vitriol is coming to you, fine, whatever, you'll deal with it. But as soon as the family start getting involved, does that cross the line? Like, are you? Active? That's what bothered me about, like, particularly, you know, my mother and things like that. Yeah, because that's totally unfair. Um, and, you know, it is... It, it, Mostly criticism is water off a duck's back to me, as you say. The thing that I don't like is when some someone criticizes me based on something that isn't true. So if they believe something about me themselves that isn't true, I'm okay with that, you know. But I'm not okay with them saying, oh, he's this because of this. And if that thing doesn't, you know, isn't a thing, then that slightly annoys me, maybe slightly frustrates me. But mostly I don't, I'm not subjected to it anyway. And it doesn't really happen now because I'm just a, you know, a retiree, you know, making and consuming journalists.